We recently spoke with a surgeon in Europe whose innovative operative techniques are revolutionizing cancer surgery in Europe, and he complained to us about how difficult it had become for him to find creative young surgeons who were interested in carrying on his work. And he blamed this difficulty on changes in the educational system in his home country, where medical schools have become so popular that officials have decided that they can accept only students who've earned perfect grades in all the preceding years. And the surgeon stated that although these perfect students were expert test takers and essay writers, they showed little interest in innovation, in questioning the status quo, or in working in fields like cancer surgery where there often isn't a single right answer, but only trade-offs, best fits, and on-the-spot problem solving. Shortly after this conversation, we heard from three children that we followed over the years. Each child is remarkably bright and creative, and yet each had struggled in some way with basic or rote skills in school. Struggled so much, in fact, that they found it hard to stay in school, ultimately deciding to homeschool for part or all of their education. The recent emails we got from their parents now contain good news. The oldest, a 15-year-old from England, had recently been awarded two patents for a device that he helped invent to help stroke victims grip objects with weak hands. The others, both 12-year-olds and living in the States, recently won awards at prestigious competitions, one in art and the other in science. What do all these stories share in common? Each displays a tension between the student's abilities to master certain highly organized academic skills and their abilities to excel in more innovative open-ended pursuits, or we might also say the tension between expertise and creativity. To understand this tension and its implications for education, let's look more closely at the skills underlying expertise and creativity, using as an analogy for each the behavior of an animal that represents it. We call skills of the first type turkey skills. Turkey skills consist of kinds of basic or automatic skills that we learn and practice until we can perform them like experts, quickly, predictably, reliably, precisely, unthinkingly, and automatically. In school, these are the kinds of classic academic skills that are stressed almost exclusively by the standards movements. These skills include reading and spelling, handwriting and written conventions, grammar and syntax, math rules and procedures, social and behavioral rules, and facts that are learned by rote. We call these turkey skills not to poke fun at them, but because mother turkeys show some remarkable automatic behaviors in response to their chicks. When a mother turkey hears the distress calls of her babies, she'll act quickly, sheltering her chicks under her wings. The response is fast, reliable, and automatic. Just how completely the skill becomes hardwired was demonstrated by an animal behaviorist, M.K. Fox, who showed that if you put a recording of turkey chick chicks cheeping inside a stuffed polecat, a natural enemy of the turkey, a mother turkey will run to the polecat like it's one of its babes, taking it under its wings and trying to put it underneath her like one of her chicks. While your initial response is probably amazement at how stupid turkeys can be, <laughs> if you put yourself in the place of an infant turkey, which would you rather have? A mother who's been hardwired to respond automatically and unthinkingly to your distress call, or one who pauses to consider whether she's being fooled by an ornithologist? Consider that in all of recorded history, no actual polecat has ever learned to cheep, and the ratio of true to simulated turkey distress calls is approximately infinity to one. So a hardwired response really does make sense for this purpose. It's the same way with many of the basic skills that we teach in school. It's for their glory and not their shame that the skills can become as stupid, automatic, and unthinking as a response of the mother turkey. Whether it's learning math facts or writing letters or words without thinking of every twist and turn of the fingers, Automatic and rote skills are at their most valuable when they can be performed as quickly and unthinkingly as possible. Because these skills play so central role in education, in a very real sense, most educational systems have at their heart the goal of turning us in certain ways into turkeys. And that's not all bad because turkey skills are valuable in situations where speed and reliability, reliability are helpful. And that's true of many of the situations that we face in life. And not all turkey skills are trivial or low level either. Turkey skills can be quite complex and used to solve even many conventional and routine problems. Much of what we regard as expertise has a great deal of turkey skill in it. This includes tasks that involve judgments that are based on factual knowledge and also many types of logical analysis like deductive reasoning and incremental steps. These are turkey skills because they're based largely on the application of hardwired factual or procedural information in straightforward ways. Yet they're critically important for many tasks and they're nothing to sneer at. 
the problem comes when we think that turkey skills are the keys to everything and act as if turkey skills and equipping children with an increasing number of prepackaged, hardwired responses are the best ways to cope with an increasingly complex world. In reality, turkey approaches tend to fail when they encounter situations that are new and changing or when novel situations arise that require more than expertise for something that's known. In these more complex, changeable, and unprecedented settings, which require more than minor modifications of previously developed responses, problem-solving, creativity, and innovation are needed, and a different set of skills are required. Creative skills that permit solving problems in non-automatic, non-linear ways. We call these different skills crow skills. There's several remarkable things about crows. They're the only other animals besides humans that use tertiary tools. That is, tools directed at other tools that are then used to reach a particular goal. Crows can also innovate. This video is from some excellent work done by Dr. Alex Kachelnik and his group at Oxford. What you're seeing is the crow Betty. She first tries using a length of wire to reach a food basket, but she's unsuccessful. Then she uses a different strategy. She bends a wire. <laughs> Voila, innovation. While crow skills like these are preferable in newer changing settings, they're not always better than turkey skills. Crow skills are often slower, <laughs> place a greater demand on working memory, require leaps of thought and perceptions of distant relationships rather than incremental judgments, and depend on a physically complex process of sharing information that involves many different parts of the brain. As such, they're unpredictable and much less reliable than hardwired skills. Inspiration may not come when you need it, and your muse may not keep regular office hours. In addition, Crow students can be inconvenient and uncomfortable to have in the classroom. Studies have shown that traits associated with creativity, like independent-mindedness, individualism, and risk-taking are likely to lead to teacher disapprovals and to lower estimates of intelligence. Teachers as well as farmers know how troublesome crows can be. Ultimately, crow and turkey skills are useful in different ways, and both are often needed in most organizations and for many complex tasks. Yet our educational system is focused more and more on developing turkey rather than crow skills. We've just heard Ken Robinson express this point in different terms, along with his belief that we're ad actually educating children out of their creativity. Is there any other evidence for this charge? In fact, there is. In May 2010, psychologist Kyung Hee Kim of the College of William & Mary demonstrated that during the last 20 years, the creativity scores of American school children have been steadily declining on the Torrance test of creative thinking, the most widely accepted test of creativity. Why this decline? While some have blamed the fact that children now spend more time on uncreative activities like video gaming or consuming media than on creative play, the almost exclusive focus on turkey skills in our schools also hinders the development of creativity. Former Education Secretary Rod Page described the goal of No Child Left Behind, which has dominated curriculum development over the last decade, as equipping all students with the academic skills upon which America's future depends. These academic skills are almost all turkey skills. Unfortunately, focusing on turkey and neglecting crow skills is a poor way to promote success because crow skills are becoming increasingly necessary in the job market, as pointed out by policy analysts from the Pew Center on the states. In their work and their report on new work, they state that for the U.S. to flourish, students must move up the pyramid of human talent so that they can fill creative jobs at the top that drive innovation. In other words, jobs that require crow skills. So an education focused on the development of more extensive or numerous turkey skills won't prepare them for those jobs. In other words, building a better turkey won't make a crow. This is one of the illusory promises of the standards movement. Standards that stress turkey skills, even when they're met, can't do more than make our students into better turkeys. While becoming a first-class turkey is not a trivial goal because turkey skills really are important, the limitations of this approach must also be understood. A good example of this turkey-centered approach is the way that essay questions are graded on tests like the SAT or many state-mandated tests. The scoring of these tests typically focuses on the form of the answers rather than the content of the arguments produced. This is a classic turkey approach, while a crow approach would be scored in precisely the opposite way. 
In fact, an exclusive focus on Turkey skills sets back the development of creativity in two ways. First, it prevents the teaching of Crow skills. Already it seems that there's little time in the curriculum for all the facts and procedures that are deemed essential. So Crow skills are crowded out, leaving Turkey biased students to have unwelcome surprises when they get out into the real world trying to succeed and compete in Crow disciplines. Second, it can kill crows, an environment that's all turkey starves crows, especially students who are extreme crows. In reality, individuals vary in their tendency to favor turkey or crow approaches. In fact, research on the brain functions that underlie turkey and pro crow approaches suggests that there's a bell-shaped distribution of certain turkey and crow traits in the human population. There's even evidence from structural brain studies that a trade-off may exist between processes that mediate fine detail expertise and big picture creative reasoning so that superiority in one might be achieved at the expense of the other. Maybe that's why individuals far out on the crow end of the distribution curve have difficulty mastering basic crow turkey skills. Frequently on IQ tests like the WISS-4, crow bias students earn higher than average scores on verbal and perceptual reasoning, but lower than average scores on working memory and processing speed. These latter lower scores reflect problems making skills automatically and performing them without conscious effort. Individuals with this pattern almost always struggle to master turkey skills, and they're frequently diagnosed with dyslexia or ADHD or misdiagnosed with autism spectrum disorders. At the same time, studies have also shown that these students often score higher than average on creativity tests, which is a clear reflection of their crow bias. As we show in our new book, The Dyslexic Advantage, after struggling as students, many of these students go on to become some of the most creative and successful members of our society. Viewing individuals who show strengths in crow skills but weaknesses in turkey skills as simply learning disordered is a huge mistake and one with potentially disastrous consequences, not only for them, the individuals themselves, but for us as a society because we'll be deprived of their contributions. Yet this is exactly what happens when we make turkey skills the gold standards of achievement and the gatekeepers for advancement. As in the case that we described at the beginning of our talk, this can be especially hard on some of our students, including many of our most creative. They'll be especially disadvantaged. When turkey skills rule the educational roost, many crows will be lost before they reach the place where they can show their true worth. Our surgical colleague experienced the results of this process firsthand, and the same loss will be experienced by any college or training program that weeds out potential candidates on the basis of poor performance in a broad range of turkey skills. This is especially true in the design-based, mechanical, or so-called STEM disciplines of science, technology, engineering, and math. This practice of requiring a high level of turkey achievement to advance in fields where creative crow skills are especially important makes as little sense as selecting members of the Olympic team by written exam, but that's essentially what we're doing. Yet there's no reason to starve or to screen out crows with early identification and an education that's directed at them, their strengths as well as their weaknesses, and more educational alternatives. There's no reason that students who heavily favor crow skills can't thrive in school. While younger students who favor crow skills often struggle to master turkey skills through repetition, drill, and the bottom-up process of learning basic facts and procedures by rote, they often will learn well using project-based learning, dramatizations, or reverse learning techniques like ABC or application before, before uh, concept, or inductive processes that involve reasoning back from experiences, experiments, and examples to general principles. When they must learn facts, they learn best when facts have not been stripped of context and approached by rote, but when they remain embodied in cases, stories, examples, and applications. For crow-based students, the basic building blocks of education are strategies, stories, experiments, projects, and examples, which become their templates and raw materials, their puzzle pieces and mosaic tiles for later creative work. Like Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes, who ignited the scientific revolution, they delight in pursuing knowledge for practical ends rather than pure intellectual reasons. Importantly, these same techniques can be used to nourish crow skills in everyone, and all students should be encouraged to feed their inner crows. Creativity is itself a kind of skill that can be practiced and learned, and the techniques of research, incubation, and divergent and convergent thinking that underlie the creative process can enhance creativity and problem solving for all students. Now the tendency for administrators on hearing such information is usually to look for some simple change that can be made to the current school system to provide a quick fix. 
But simple patches on the existing system won't do enough. There's some fundamental differences in the ways that students are wired which demand a greater need for individualization and greater flexibility in when and how different students acquire the various necessary skills. The techniques we've discussed above can be useful for enhancing Crow learning in any classroom, but a greater use of online and project-based learning and greater flexibility in school choice based on interest, aptitude, and learning style is also essential. Ultimately, developing a successful approach to education should involve a kind of occupational anthropology where we study adults to discover which skills they actually use in their jobs, determine how those skills develop, and see which educational experiences are most helpful in developing those skills. We also need to understand the message of the Yellow Pages, which reveals the tremendous variety of occupations that adults in our society can pursue. Contrast this variety with the shockingly few options available in many schools that's represented by the regular accelerated and special education programs. It shouldn't be surprising, given this imbalance, that many students fail to find a good fit in our schools. In the end, what we need is a greater appreciation of neurodiversity, respect for differences, and placing more value on individuals for who they are. Many of the children we see now for learning disorders would, in a better world, be seen as learners with differences. As with the brain, ability and intelligence aren't uniform but multifaceted, and they're diffused throughout the members of our society rather than centralized in an elite few. That's why the function of our society as a whole will only reach its full potential when each member is allowed to become an optimal version of him or herself. All individuals deserve the opportunity to become the best examples they can be of the kinds of thinkers and doers that they really are, rather than forced to become bad examples of someone they were never intended to be. As a society, we must learn to better understand and foster all the varieties of cognitive and creative skill that are present in our different members, because we need them all. And some of those we'll need most, both now and in the future, are the very ones that up till now we valued least. Thank you. Thank you.